I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, a rather disturbing action taken by the internet giant YouTube, which is now owned and operated by the media mogul Google. Many of you may know the Israeli website Palestinian Media Watch. We've often spoken on JBS with the founding director of Palestinian Media Watch, Itamar Marcus who's doing very important work monitoring the positions taken by the Palestinian Authority and by Palestinian leadership. Very often, Palestinian leaders, like PA President Mahmoud Abbas, says one thing in English for Western consumption, while saying very different things in Arabic for the Arab audience. Palestinian Media Watch, P. MW monitors Palestinian publications, such as official PA textbooks, monitor what's being said and taught to children on official PA television. And so often it's striking and chilling to see and hear what Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority are saying and teaching and preaching and doing inside the Palestinian community. And Itamar Marcus and Palestinian Media Watch shines a light on all of it and exposes what is really being said and taught and done in the Palestinian community and reveals the true nature of official Palestinian attitudes toward Israel, toward Jews, toward any peace resolution of the Palestinian war on Israel. And by doing all this, Itamar Marcus makes some people whom you'd think should know better very upset. And some actually try to silence Itamar Marcus and his Palestinian media watch which is exactly what YouTube did last week. YouTube shut down Palestinian Media Watch and took it off its YouTube website. Now YouTube has suddenly reversed its position and has restored PMW. But anyone who cares about the state of Israel or the Jewish people or the principle of free speech should be outraged that YouTube threw Palestinian Media Watch off its site. And the fact that YouTube has reversed itself does not mitigate the frightening reality that major powers on the American scene and of Western culture are willing to silence the truth if that truth supports the state of Israel and exposes the lies of the Palestinian leadership. Well, we thought it important for you to hear from Itamar Marcus himself on this issue. And so once again, I'm so pleased to have on our JBS phones from Efrat Israel, the director of Palestinian Media Watch, Itamar Marcus. Itamar, thank you so much for joining us again. Oh, it's always great to be with you. Thank you. Itamar, um, when did you first learn that YouTube had taken PMW off its site? Well, it's um, the way it works on YouTube is you have three strikes, uh, three opportunities um, to, to be penalized before they actually close down your account. So what happened, and this is quite interesting or, or quite, I would say, worrying, um, over a period of weeks, there was someone or some people or some organization that was actively targeting PMW. Uh, they sent in complaints about videos. Now, these are videos that showed Palestinian children calling for war. One of them included a child holding a machine gun and, uh, and calling for, for terror and everything against Israelis. Uh, very, very hateful videos. Now, when we expose them, the world knows what the Palestinians are teaching their people. By taking them off from YouTube, people don't know this. So someone put in complaints about videos that were a number of years old. Somebody was searching for the worst things, and the first day we got 
a strike on three different videos, that was considered the first strike. So we put in a request to have it removed. We explained what we explained. Uh, we turned to people who'd helped us in the past with YouTube. About a week later, we got a second strike, and they froze the account, meaning we couldn't upload new videos, but they wouldn't close down all the videos. Okay, hold, hold, on, er hold on one second. What's a strike? You, get, you said you had one strike, then two strikes. What does a strike mean? That's a complaint that they accept. That they accept. Are you given a yes. chance Somebody, to rebut? Absolutely not. No chance to rebut. Mm -hmm. All right, so you had two no strikes. Chance to rebut. Go ahead. And we had a number of people trying to help and speaking to people inside Google, and these are people who have helped us in the past. And Google has known and, and supposedly had put PMW down on an okay list, but they didn't. In other words, they had said that they did, but they didn't. Uh, that's what we had been told. And, uh, and then whoever's been doing this put in another complaint on another terrible video, and we had the three strikes, and they closed the entire account, meaning all of our videos. The hundreds of Palestinian Media Watch videos were then taken away so that anyone who had a link to a video could not see any of the videos. Now, we know it was planned and organized because we also have a Hebrew account, we have an Italian account, we have Russian, Spanish. Four different accounts were targeted uh, consistently over a period of, uh, of these few weeks. Uh, we ended up with strikes on every other account as well. Okay. Um, and eventually they closed it down. I understand. Uh, when you say they targeted a specific video which was horrible or terrible, horrible or terrible in what sense, Itamar? In that it was promoting hatred against Israelis, hatred against Jews, promoting violence, promoting terror. Uh, and these are videos that get the Palestinian Authority into a lot of trouble when they're exposed. Uh, and okay. that's why people were trying to get them off. Oh, okay. You were trying to expose the hatred that exists and you know, the incitement that exists in the Palestinian world. You were not showing these videos because you were promoting whatever they were promoting. Did Google or YouTube make a distinction between the fact that you are a watchdog organization? Your job is to show the world what these videos are preaching. You are not promoting. You are not suggesting that people engage in violence, certainly the violence that is being represented in these videos. It sounds to me like... Here you are, a watchdog, and they hold you responsible for the content of the videos you are shining a light on. Exactly. These videos have been shown at hearings in Congress. They've been shown in literally dozens of parliaments around the world. They have impacted tremendously on the world's understanding of the Palestinian Authority, and they have to be out there. They have to be available for people. Uh, governments have cut off funding to the Palestinian Authority. The United States has cut off funding to Palestinian Authority television. Everyone needs this information, and then Google goes and, and takes it off. Okay. Did now, anyone got at, it back again. Did anyone at Google or at YouTube, from Google or YouTube, did anyone contact you to discuss this with you or to explain they were going to do this about one strike, two strike, three strike. Anybody talk to you ahead of time? No, we get automatic emails saying what the situation is, warning us what will happen if we continue, uh, and then they took it. Uh, then they took us down. And then what happened was we we announced this to our email list, and apparently there was a I mean, we know many many people told us that they sent in complaints to Google. And it was just a few hours later that Google actually uh, returned uh, returned our site and put us again in good standing. So the the the, the two things the things here are very interesting. First of all, who was the force? Who were the people? Which was the organization that was trying to undermine Palestinian Media Watch and really run interference for the Palestinian Authority? And that's something we have no way of knowing. Now Google could figure this out. Google Google knows who's putting in the complaints. But, of course, unfortunately, they would never give us that information. That Those complaints would be very valuable for us if we knew where they were coming from, but we, we are not able to get that information. 
Uh, and the second thing is Google by now, this has happened, numerous, this is, I think, the third time we've run this cycle with Google. You would think that this giant of technology could once and for all put it into their computer system that Palestinian Media Watch is is doing a service for the United States Congress, the United States administration, uh, for the world, uh, and therefore we do not close them down. You'd think they would be able to do that. Uh, unfortunately, they have not yet done that. I understand. Um, it's interesting. It sounds to me like there this is some kind of automatic shutdown. And what you're saying is, by this time, Google should have had a way of sor short-circuiting the automatic shutdown. It does not sound to me like YouTube or Google ever articulated a rationale to you. They just did this based on protests being lodged against you. Am I correct? That's correct. However, in order for them to put it back, that means they had to look at the videos. They had to, this time, in other words, there had to be a human being involved here. They had to look at the videos. They had to realize that these are videos exposing a real danger. Uh, and, and, then they, and then they reinstated us. Now, like I said, if they were, you know, if there was a real interest into resolving this problem that TMW keeps having, uh, then Google would have put it into their computer system. And that is the real problem here. Why isn't Google putting it into their system already that Palestinian Media Watch is an okay organization? In other words, they had to conclude that to put us back on. Yes. And to put back all the hateful videos, they put them back yes. online now, because now they know that those hateful videos are exposing Palestinian Authority mm -hmm. hatred. And yet... And yet, they, uh, they haven't put anything in the system yet to prevent this from happening again. Okay. Do you think YouTube and Google have another reason for letting this happen to you? Is there a, quote, real reason this happens? Or do you think it's bureaucratic nonsense? I think that it's possible the first time was bureaucratic nonsense, and the second time, uh, the fact that it keeps recurring, the fact that somebody is not putting it into the computer to protect Palestinian Media Watch, I think that's, that's something that might be more more sinister out there. Again, it's difficult to say. We don't know the ideologies of these people. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going on, and I don't want to accuse them if it's, if it's really just a bureaucracy, but it just seems to be absurd that this uh, technology giant can't figure out a way of putting this into the system. Exactly. Itamar, you heard me say at the beginning that I find this development both outrageous and frightening. First, I want to know if you think I'm overstating the case and whether you feel this YouTube, Google action poses a real threat, not only to the state of Israel, but to the concept of free speech in America and the free world. Am I overstating it? If I'm not, what do you think it means? That really depends on to what extent uh, the decisions were made to let this happen to PMW again. Now, there, there are things that are happening out there on the U.S. campuses, uh, in different countries, uh, people who are exposing hatred in the world who are being taken down and aren't given that free speech. Uh, we see on the American campuses uh, when people go and speak with not according to the, the standard left-wing ideology on campus and they get shut down. Uh, we've seen the riots keeping uh, right-wing speakers away, and it's not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing. They have a right in a democracy in the United States. People should be able to. Uh, I'll give you an example of what happened to me. I was speaking at... Uh, I was speaking at a university in Washington. Now I can't remember which one because I've spoken at a few. Uh, Georgetown, I think it was. Um, and what w what happened was the room was filled with people, it was filled with students, and it was going well for about five minutes. And then someone jumped up and said, stop this man, he's a war criminal, stop this man, he's a war criminal, yelling and screaming, yelling and screaming, till they took this person out of the room. Uh, it took a few minutes, and then I started speaking again another three minutes, and someone jumped up in another part of the room and did the same mm -hmm. thing. Um, I kept continuing to speak, and again, the same thing happened. So that for the first uh, half hour of my talk, every few minutes, it was disrupted I by people yelling and screaming that I'm a war criminal. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, it's, it's part of a pattern that we're seeing 
um, on many campuses and, and even in, in, in certain legislation in certain countries where people who aren't giving the, the, the standard message, which is anti-Israel, which is... Um, uh, which puts Palestinians in the good light and, and, and many other issues I don't even want to begin to get into now. If you're not going with the standard issues that's acceptable, that's politically correct today, you could be shut down by by, by 20 students in a, in a campus can, can shut you down from making a presentation. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to go on record saying that I found it chilling, frightening, and outrageous that Google would take Palestinian Media Watch off its website because there were some people who claimed that you were showing dangerous, the words, <laughs> that you were showing dangerous material on the Palestinian website, on your, on your website, and all you're doing is revealing the kind of, again, incitement and hatred that's part of the Palestinian community, which basically gets no play in the West. It, when you were off YouTube, were there any other ways in which somebody could have viewed your website? No. No, there's no way they could have viewed our okay. website. It's, it's what YouTube we're doing or now nothing. is considering having a, a backup website, uh, a backup um, server where we'll keep all the videos. In any case, it wouldn't really help because most of our videos are viewed through people who pass them on to each other and they all pass on the links, and then the link can get passed on 10, 20, 30 times, and you know, many thousands of people watch them from the links, so that even if it exists somewhere else, nobody would ever find it, because the link that, that was on YouTube, that link is now a dead end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we discussed this for a moment the last time you were on. It's interesting. You and I had a conversation virtually last week. I said, you know... Itamar, you should be on every week. So it just so happens that there's another reason for us to speak. I'm very pleased that you were available. Um, Itamar, to what extent am I correct that there is within the Western orientation, both in America and throughout Western Europe, this feeling we don't want to know? We don't want to know what Palestinian Media Watch is saying, because we want to accept a, a cartoon notion, a fantasy, that within the Palestinian community, they are as serious about peace as we want them to be, as we hope they would be. Would you speak about that reality? To what extent are you troubled by the fact that within Western culture, People don't want to hear or see what you are showing on your website. I'm very troubled by it, uh, and I just want to differentiate between different, different audiences and how we get different responses. There are certain journalists uh, connected to certain media. No matter what, we will show them. We'll sit down with them. We'll show them. It doesn't fit the message that they've been pushing all along, that mm -hmm. Israel is the problem, that the Palestinians are victims, that Israel is the Goliath, that the Palestinians are David. If it doesn't fit their uh, their messaging, then they're not going to show it, and they will keep and they'll keep doing it. Let me give you a fascinating example. This Please. isn't this isn't the West. This is in Israel. The terrorism that started in uh, in Israel in in and around Jerusalem in 2014 um, in the fall. Uh, we at Palestinian Media Watch saw that this was coming from the top, it was coming from Mahmoud Abbas. There were all these messages coming from the Israeli media that this was a spontaneous uprising, the people were upset about Israeli presence in Jerusalem, uh, and, and the people were going out and stabbing and, and car ramming on their own. So uh, Israeli television, Israeli television, the main station, Channel One, uh, called me up, as they've done many times, and they came in to interview me. And they interviewed me, and they said, can you tell us about this popular uprising? And I said, well, we don't think it's a popular uprising. Take a look at what we have here. And I showed him documentation after documentation. I showed him videos. I showed him Facebook incitement by official Palestinian Authority sources and official Fatah sources. What I did is I proved to him that this was coming from the top down. And the journalist said to me, 
this is fascinating, but this wasn't what I was looking for for my story. I'm not sure what I'm going to be able to do with it. And then I watched on the news that night. This man interviewed Palestinians from East Jerusalem who all said this is a popular uprising from the bottom up, Mm -hmm. and they completely ignored the story, which was the true story that I'd showed him, that I'd documented. And he said it to me openly. This wasn't the story that I was coming for. So that was dangerous. Now, this is Israeli television, and this is about a story that's happening in Israel. And this journalist, for whatever reason, uh, because that was his ideology, he did not want the Palestinian Authority to look bad. He thought it was exciting, it was maybe real romantic, that this was a popular uprising uh, of the people, uh, and that's what happened. So that's tragic. Uh, it happens, I'm sure, in, in Western journalism as well, but it happens even in Israeli television. It is amazing, that story. Um, by the way, I don't we don't know your wife's name. You're married with children, Yes. Yes, my wife is Shelly. Shelly? Yes. Okay. So are there times when you're talking to Shelly and you say to her, I can't believe what I'm hearing and seeing, and the frustration eats at you? Does it ever eat at you? you know, if, this, if I were in your place and I showed to an, uh, an Israeli journalist, an Israeli journalist, If I show any journalist what the truth was in black and white, and the journalist said in essence to me, I'm sorry, this doesn't fit my narrative, I can't show it, it would be frustrating beyond belief. How do you deal with that, and what do you feel? Well, uh, first of all, I, I, I feel exactly as you're describing. I feel the great frustration, but if you remember, I said there are different audiences, the audience where I don't find that, and that's the one where we're doing the most of our work, is in working directly with, with parliaments around the world and directly with members of Congress. Um, I'll just give you a fascinating statement by a member of Canadian Parliament a number of years ago. Um, he's, uh, his name is Jason Kenney. He was a member of Parliament and still is a member of Parliament in the, uh, in the Conservative Party. He, he heard me speak when his party was in the opposition. And he walked over to me afterwards and said, I have to bring you to, to Parliament, and I want you to meet all the members of leadership of my party. And I did. I went. I met the leadership. I made presentations. And I made a presentation to the shadow cabinet. This was all while they were in opposition. They won the next election, and this became the conservative party eventually under the Harper government um, that was the most pro-Israel force for mm-hmm. all of those years mm-hmm. in the entire world. That was the most pro-Israel government yes. in, the entire, in the entire world, much more than the United States during that period uh, under, the, um, under much of it under the Obama administration. Now, a few years later, this same Jason Kenney, who was really leading the charge in Parliament on behalf of Israel, um, with our material and in general, he made a speech. When he was honored at a dinner, he made a speech, and it was reported in the newspaper. And this is what he said. He said, I used to think that Israel was the bully of the Middle East until I heard a one-hour presentation of Palestinian Media Watch. And that, to me, was what makes us keep going. I understand. Here we have a member of parliament who was actually a minister in, 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 in the government at that point, mm-hmm. a member of the government. And he was leading the fight for Israel. And why was he doing this? because he was turned around from that one presentation that I gave him. Um, and, and, and essentially we turned around the Canadian government, and we had a supporter of Israel in Canada for many, many years. Um, I see this in many parliaments. I see members of parliament who just sit there dumbfounded when I'm finishing a meeting, and they'll say, I had no idea. I'd never seen this before. Um, I'm going to initiate legislation. I was in Dutch parliament uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago. I was a number of times, actually three times in one year, going on the issue of salaries, the Palestinian Authority pays salaries to terrorists, and eventually there was a vote in Dutch Parliament, 148 to 2, to cut off funding if they don't stop paying salaries to terrorists. So there is a lot of frustration with the media, but with parliaments, uh, I find that most of the members of parliament, are when they are anti-Israel, it's because... They quote thought Israel was the bully of the Middle East because they didn't have the proper information, they had misinformation. And when they're presented with proper information, when it's given to them 
black on white, when they can watch the videos, when they see what children are being taught in the school books, when they see what children are watching on official Palestinian TV, when they see terrorists turned into heroes and role models, when they see 30 schools in the Palestinian Authority named after terrorist murderers, uh, they wake up very, very quickly. Uh, they cut off funding and and they act on what they're saying. So there are two different, there are many different audiences, but I find that members of government and members of legislators, for the most part, are misinformed and uninformed, and that's what we're trying to fix. Well, Kolakovo to you, and I understand why the experiences you've just described fuel you and galvanize you, and you're doing. I'm tell, I've told you all the time, you do extraordinary work, and what I'm hoping is that viewers of JBS who might not really understand the subtleties learn, first of all, about your website, Palestinian Media Watch, and visit it. But they also learn from our discussion, so I'm very grateful. Look, uh, we're almost out of time, but since I have you here, give us an update quickly on the Hamas Fatah Unity Agreement, which we talked about last time. Has it progressed? What's the Israeli response, and how do you view it? Uh, the agreement is stalling, uh, and I believe it actually won't be resolved. The the issues, the, the ultimate issue here that that that's keeping them apart right now is the issue of the Hamas army. The Hamas is an army of over twenty five thousand people, highly armed. They have thousands, if not tens of thousands, of missiles. They, according to the agreement, they talk about having one unified force, one unified military force. That would mean that it would be under Mahmoud Abbas, under the Palestinian Authority. Hamas is never, ever going to give up mm -hmm. that army. Mm -hmm. The question is, will Mahmoud Abbas be willing to have a unity government and have a separate army yeah. running Gaza? And the answer is, I don't think so. So I think they did a lot of noise. They wanted to, each one had to show their Palestinian population that they were trying, but Hamas isn't giving up their arms, and I don't believe that Abbas can can have a pretend a pretense of unity if there are two two different armies uh, that are ruling, one in Gaza and one in uh, Judea and Samaria. Itamar, I love talking to you. I'm going to say it again. You should be on every week. I wish you called two Hatzlacha. Can don't ever get tired, and know that the work you're doing is spectacular. If you run into Shlomo Riskin and Frat, you send him our love, and we'll talk again very soon. Thank you, Itamar. You're very welcome. Be well. The thoughts of Itamar Marcus, the founding director of Palestinian Media Watch. If you're not a regular visitor to PMW, please be sure to check it out. Palwatch.org. You get the latest information on the words and deeds of the Palestinian Arab community. My thanks as always to our director Sloan Copeland, production coordinator Serge Goldberg, JBS's associate director Dara Golub, editors John McDevitt and Cordelia Sporin, and the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.